I would like to thank the organizers uh, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure and great honor to be here. Um, <clears throat> I first met uh, Jean Christophe in, uh, in the conference in uh, 1998, and uh, I told him a little bit about uh, my thesis, for which I spent years working on. And it was quite a remarkable experience when, in the winter of 1999, I think it was January, he invited me. And what took me years to work out took him hours to digest and uh, see all the technical complexity behind it, which was uh, deeply impressive for me. Uh, so uh, there was... Uh, um, uh, so uh, yesterday, Marcel Viana advertised uh, the Congress, uh, uh, which is take, uh, happening in the summer of uh, 2018. If uh, uh, some of you are interested in uh, joining the uh, Hamiltonian uh, system program on MSR, uh, at MSRI, you could uh, take... Uh, 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 you could take a, a, a little detour and uh, go there. There, are, there is quite a number of uh, long-term uh, <coughs> uh, 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 one-month uh, visiting positions, and uh, the system will be, uh, the con uh, conference will be focused around uh, uh, around Hamiltonian systems uh, with uh, various applications. So have it in mind and. Albert Fatih, who is in, uh, uh, in the audience, is the uh, main organizer. He, he knows all the details. Okay, so uh, during my talk, I will talk about uh, two different problems and one idea. And, uh, 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 and uh, it turns out that both problems are intimately related to <coughs> billiards in the convex region. Uh, so, which I usually call Birkhoff billiards. Uh, so, uh, uh, the first story, namely the story of Birkhoff billiards and Birkhoff conjecture, uh, will occupy probably one uh, third of the talk. And uh, basically, we want to understand uh, the properties of a billiard map. Uh, or we want to uh, understand properties of a domain by knowing properties of its billiard. So we want to solve an inverse problem. Uh, more precisely, we want to characterize integrable billiards. And it turns out that this, uh, the methodology which we are developing is closely related to a uh, question of marked cuts. And this is a second problem. I said there will be two problems. Uh, so it's closely related to a question of marked cuts. Can you hear the shape of a drum? And it turns out that this question is also closely related to billiards. And uh, you imagine uh, 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 in, in the drum, which you can imagine. And uh, the second type of result uh, uh, will be uh, about uh, so-called deformational spectral rigidity. Namely, if you could deform a domain without deforming its uh, so-called Laplace spectrum or length spectrum. So first part about billiards and integrable billiards, and second part about uh, rigidity properties of billiards or sound. And after that, I'll uh, tell you some ideas of a proof. And if I will have time, I'll tell you about a possible approach to uh, attack Birgov conjecture. Uh, all, this, all this stuff will be perturbative, and I will explain you in what things it is perturbative. And uh, as I said at the end, if I'll have time, I'll uh, tell you about how one could go from a perturbative picture to a, a non-perturbative. So let me start with the first part. Again, there will be two problems. One will be a Birgov conjecture, and another is uh, spectral rigidity. So I start with um, uh, uh, billiards, which were, uh, were discussed already yesterday. Uh, so. On this blackboard, I will use a finite dimensional picture. And on the blackboard there, I will go to infinite dimensional picture, inf finite dimensional picture. So when you have a convex domain omega in R2, uh, you are studying the following dynamical system. You send a, a particle, and it uh, uh, flies without a friction. And then when after it collides, then angle of uh, reflection is equal to angle of incidence. And it's very useful to 
uh, associate to this uh, uh, dynamical system a billiard map. So the way it is usually done, you choose S to be a lens parameterization uh, and phi to be an angle. And then uh, what you do, you form a map uh, which takes uh, a parameterization S into parameterization S prime. Uh, and uh, you get a map from S phi to S prime phi prime. And uh, many here uh, study a conservative system. So this is a map of a cylinder. And uh, it is symplectic with an area form, uh, uh, I guess, sine phi d phi ds. So when you are studying this dynamical system, you could either imagine that the trajectory bounces uh, against the boundary, or you could think that you take a point uh, with coordinates s phi, and you map it to a coordinate s prime phi prime. And you want to understand dynamics of this system. And uh, uh, it's somewhat sarcastically that these systems were introduced about 90 years ago, and the very basic questions about these systems are uh, uh, open. Uh, for example, nobody knows whether there is, there is an open set of periodic orbits. Neither one can exclude it. Okay, I will, I will be interested in a very special billiards, and I, the goal of uh, Birkhoff conjecture is to prove that uh, these very special billiards are the only very special billiards. Namely, I would like to study billiards in an ellipse. So I want to start with an ellipse, and I want to consider a cofocal ellipse. So this is a, an ellipse, and these are two foci and they consider a cofocal ellipse. And there is the following remarkable property uh, of an ellipse. If you take a ray uh, inside of an ellipse, and you take a, a cofocal ellipse which is tangent to this ray, then uh, after reflection, it is still tangent. And this is a theorem of Poncelier. It is true for any ellipse and cofocal ellipse. And it turns out that curves, it turns out that the, in terms of the billiard map, it uh, corresponds to the following. Uh, uh, you have a cylinder, and for a cylinder, you have an invariant curve. Uh, so, uh, and for this invariant curve, you simply have a map which takes one point of this invariant curve into another. And uh, 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 let me give a formal definition. Uh, uh, I want to consider only convex curves, even though there are uh, 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 non-convex curves with satisfying this property. So I want to consider a smooth, I should have added closed convex curve, and the property is as in this picture. If I uh, send the ray tangent to this curve, then after reflection, it is again tangent, and uh, it is an easy exercise to say that uh, every caustic of a billiard map corresponds to an invariant curve of a cylinder. Uh, now, uh, let me do the following. Let me do the following formal procedure. Let me take a union over all caustics. Uh, so um, the caustics are very special. Uh, and once you find it, then uh, actually dynamics of a billiard map is uh, 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 splits into exterior dynamics and interior dynamics. And this is uh, closely related to a well-known phenomena which is called whispering galleries. So uh, uh, if you manage to find the caustic close to the boundary, then the caustic splits the dynamics, the one which is in blue region, with the one which is in the white region. So once you manage to find uh, uh, a caustic, you could, uh, uh, you could uh, basically log the dynamics uh, into exterior dynamics and interior dynamics. And there was uh, been tre tremendous work done by Lazutkin applying KM theory uh, in this situation. Now, um, let me look at something which uh, there is no consensus uh, among experts, so I'll give a definition which I think uh, uh, 
is, uh, um, is natural. Now let me look at the union of caustics and uh, uh, let me take a union over all caustics uh, and let me look at a component near the boundary. So let me look at the connected component of the interior of the caustics near the boundary. And let me say that if this is not empty, then the billiard is integrable. So visually, you could say that uh, my billiard is integrable if either on a billiard picture, you have a neighborhood of the boundary which is foliated by caustics. Or if you more like the cylinder picture, then uh, the billiard is integrable if uh, a neighborhood uh, of the boundary of the corresponding billiard map is foliated by caustics. So basically integrability could be either a local property if uh, this union uh, is big or uh, is small or it could be a global property if this union is big. And uh, uh, as you saw, Pancelia theorem implies that uh, uh, ellipse is a perfect example of a, an integrable billiard uh, because when you take union over all uh, caustics, then you will get everything except the segment which uh, connects the, uh, uh, the foci. So the Strong-Birgov conjecture says that the inverse is true. Namely, if there is a strip near the boundary which is integrable, then it is an ellipse. So you could say that ellipse by Poncelle means integrable, and uh, the Birgov conjecture says the E converse is true. And uh, this is an old question, and uh, uh, it is often attributed uh, to Birgov. Uh, sometimes uh, it is called uh, Paritsky, birgov paritsky conjecture, and the reason it's called birgov paritsky conjecture because there is a paper of Paritsky where he, uh, he claimed to solve this conjecture, and, the very and in the very introduction of this uh, paper, he says that when he was a postdoc between 1924 and 1926, he learned this conjecture from Birgov. So Birgov was definitely aware of this conjecture, but he did not state it in his uh, paper of uh, 1927. And uh, um, for some time, uh, there was no progress on this conjecture, even though it was mentioned in the book of Jorgen Moser, uh, selected chapters of calculus of variation in the book of Tabachnikov, uh, in a survey of Gutkin. So the conjecture is to say that uh, uh, if the billiard is integrable, then it's only ellipse which satisfies this property. And uh, the property of being integrable near the boundary is important because there are some justification by Trishov which shows that if you replace notion of integrability, then there are counterexamples uh, which are almost rigorous. Okay, so uh, now I'd like to tell you some partial progress which we managed to obtain uh, in the direction of this conjecture, and I need uh, uh, a notion of integrability. So first, uh, also let me mention that there is a work of Bialy where he proved that if the whole table is foliated by caustics, then it has to be a circle, and there is a different proof uh, of this theorem by Waitkowski. Okay, uh, so uh, first let me point out that to every caustic, I can associate the rotation number, and the simplest reason to associate the rotation number is simply uh, look at the rotation number of the corresponding invariant curve. And uh, it's a trivial remark, but I will still say it, that uh, uh, the rotation number, it goes to zero when uh, uh, the curve converges to the boundary. So roughly speaking here, you could say that the rotation uh, number is zero uh, on the boundary. 
And uh, when the rotation number becomes small, then the corresponding caustic has to be close to the boundary. Uh, for example, this one has a rotation number, I believe, one eighth. And now let me give a, a key definition. Let me say that uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the domain is one over Q integrable. Uh, if I look at the region which is integrable, and it contains all the rotation numbers between uh, 0 and 1 over Q0. Uh, for example, if uh, Q0 is not so small, say, uh, is not so large, for example, 1 over 3, then you have big region of instability. And then as Q0 increases, your region of integrability decreases. So the bigger is Q0, the smaller is the strip of uh, integrability. And uh, naturally, as Q0 goes to infinity, the strip of integrability goes to zero. And uh, here's the first result, and uh, it's a joint work with uh, Arturo Avila, who is in the audience, and Jacopo de Simoy. So we uh, looked at the following problem, and now let me go to an infinite dimensional picture. So for the infinite dimensional picture, uh, I look at the space of domains. Uh, so if you want, you could say CR uh, plus one boundary. Uh, and then uh, in this uh, space, what I want to consider, I want to consider a circle, uh, which is a very special value. And then uh, what we would like to consider in this space of domains, we want to consider that this is a, a neighborhood. So we want to consider a perturbative picture. We start from the circle, and for the circle you could basically compute anything you want. And then uh, you shake the circle, but as you shake the circle, you don't want to destroy, think of it as a, a foliation by invariant curves of the Kalisbondian billiard map, or foliation by caustics for, uh, for the corresponding billiard table. So uh, the first step is, uh, and I will uh, tell you the story of going to the space of perturbations, is uh, you look at the small neighborhood uh, in the space of domains and you want to analyze uh, uh, the inverse problem. You know the properties of the billiard and you want to look at the space of perturbations and you want to analyze the space of perturbations. So um, uh, uh, let me now consider special one-parameter family. These are ellipses. Uh, and this is a one-parameter family which actually degenerates into a line. That's why I'm going to the boundary. And the next step we've done uh, so almost half a year ago with uh, Alfonso Sorrentino. If this is a family of ellipses, then we manage to analyze a neighborhood of a family of ellipses, but again, the picture will be, uh, ha the, the story will be happening in the space of perturbations, and I hope to give you a flavor of what is happening. Uh, basically, you start with an ellipse, you shake your ellipse, and as you shake your ellipse, you don't want to destroy uh, a, a foliation by caustics. And uh, 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 recently, we posted it uh, recently on archive, we proved uh, uh, the following theorem. So you see in both of these results, uh, we are inquiring one over three integrability. So basically we assume that there is a fairly large set of caustics uh, which are preserved. So in the joint work with Guan Juan and Alfonso Sorrentino, we managed to uh, relax this condition, uh, namely, um, uh, the theorem is the following. You pick a number, uh, uh, the, uh, the one you like, for example, one million, and then uh, there is an algorithmic procedure of uh, producing, uh, roughly speaking, one million matrices of size one million by one million, 
And uh, what we need to check, we need to check the determinants of those matrices uh, 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 are not zero. So say Q0, let's say, uh, large. Uh, uh, and if determinants of those matrices are not zero, then again, deformation of an ellipse uh, is again an ellipse. Uh, and um, we, we managed to verify it from Mathematica with four, five, and six. And uh, well, when it uh, was computing six, it was already on the laptop computing for 20 minutes. And we, uh, we didn't see much of a motivation without powerful computer to go much beyond because probably within two hours it would compute seven. But uh, you need a much more powerful computer to um, verify this condition uh, for really large queues. And let me mention that this uh, uh, result, is, uh, the third result, is conceptually different from the previous two because uh, uh, there is a discussion among people studying uh, integrable systems where the local integrability implies global integrability. And there are some serious indications that at least in the analytic world, uh, uh, and certainly in a finitely smooth world, this is not true. If you have local integrability, it does not imply global integrability. And one of the goals of the project, which I started several years ago, to try to understand why billiards are so special that uh, they are not like typical twist maps. And this theorem is one of the uh, reasons why billiards are special. Because for billiards, even though you have a, only a tiny strip which is integrable, you could extract information about uh, the whole domain and go from local integrability to global integrability. So this is uh, basically a picture which we managed to obtain for uh, the B Birgov conjecture. And maybe I could summarize these results and say that uh, if, I, if we are perturbing something which we know very well, then we could obtain information about, uh, uh, about nearby system provided it is integrable. And now I go to a second story, and the second story is uh, can you hear the shape of a drum? So the story starts from far away, and uh, uh, it looks, uh, I don't know, you could uh, tell it to your child. Uh, um, so the story is that somebody is playing a drum, and you are either sitting blindfolded, or you sit in another room, and you just hear it. So you hear the sound, and as you hear the sound, you want to uh, understand what is the shape of a drum. Uh, and certainly, uh, I don't know if you ever tried to do it, if the drum is big or the drum is small, you could certainly see that the sound is different. Uh, but the question is whether you could completely recover the domain. So here's the mathematical version of it. You start with a Dirichlet problem uh, uh, with a domain omega. Uh, it will be the same domain omega as here, and you will see the connection in a few minutes. So I pick the domain where I want to play a billiard ball problem, and instead of playing billiard ball problem, I look at the Dirichlet problem, and I consider uh, 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 the following uh, Dirichlet boundary value problem. Uh, and uh, I mean, since it's a dynamical audience, let me just give you a baby example. Suppose the domain is simply a square. And if the domain is simply a square, then it's very elementary to solve the corresponding Dirichlet problem. And the solutions will be products of signs in one variable and product of signs in another variable. So I will give you a domain. And uh, you could produce uh, an infinite sequence of numbers. So before I was doing uh, inverse problems, namely from property, uh, from some properties I wanted to recover the domain. And here the question is the same. So I was already corrected. Uh, so Mark Katz in 1966, he popularized this question. Uh, and uh, the question most probably goes back to Herman Weil. So the question is, I give you the collection of numbers and you want to find out the domain. And uh, certainly, if you have this collection of numbers, there, are, there is a number of things you could say. And the, uh, the most famous result in this field is the uh, Weyl's law. So what it says, it says that you could easily compute the area of the domain. 
And in order to compute the area of the domain, as an example that you know something about your domain, is you look at the number of these numbers uh, or eigenvalues. So in this case, uh, you have integer points on the plane. Uh, and uh, uh, then you count the number of integer points inside of a circle. Uh, you take a limit, and you get an area. So that's an example that if you know the collection of numbers, you know the area. Uh, you could form a different uh, collection of, uh, you, you can form a different limit and you can find uh, length of the boundary. But the question is, uh, you know the collection of numbers, can you determine the domain? And uh, to this precise mathematical question, there is a precise mathematical answer. So these are two drums, which uh, often uh, you could see people when they play drums, they, they sound the same but they are actually different. And uh, there is a certainly a criticism uh, uh, of this example uh, because these domains are, have neither smooth boundary nor convex, and people who are at least playing billiards, they see a uh, huge difference between uh, whether the domain is uh, strictly convex or it is not convex. So uh, at the moment, there are no examples uh, with uh, 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 smooth boundary uh, of, uh, of two drums which sound the same, but there is a very closely related uh, uh, picture with uh, geodesic flows uh, uh, on the surfaces, and let me uh, uh, shrug the difference under the carpet, and let me tell you that uh, 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 what is known is that if you want to have one million drums or one million domains which sound the same, uh, then there exists an algorithm. So there is an algorithm which uh, goes back to uh, Sunada, and there is a uh, important contribution of Engeras. So basically, the picture is that in this space of domains, uh, you might have uh, finitely many points, and for each of those points, you compute the corresponding Laplace spectrum, and you get uh, 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 the plus spectrum is going to be the same. So you could have uh, finitely many points with the same Laplace spectrum, finitely many domains. And there is a uh, theorem of Osgood, Phillips, and Sarnak, which says that if you impose the domains to have C infinity boundary, then you should have compact set. And uh, um, uh, uh, in uh, 1990, uh, when Sarnak was writing uh, a report about uh, uh, this work, he made the following conjecture, uh, which uh, he told me is that uh, uh, he believes that the right conjecture is that uh, the isospectral set consists of isolated points. Namely, maybe it is possible that, uh, uh, that there are two domains with smooth boundary which sound the same, but they should not be close to each other. And uh, there are results uh, about analytic deformations of ellipses, and there are results I should point out, yeah, about uh, generic analytic symmetric domains. There is a huge difference between analytic domains and smooth domains, because for analytic domains, if you find an expansion close to one point, you could use analytic continuation. For smooth domains, you cannot use analytic uh, continuation, so the question is fundamentally different. You need to find a mechanism which captures all of the boundary, not only uh, a tiny fragment of the boundary. So you see, at this point, the, uh, the, uh, the picture looks dramatically different, so let me slightly change uh, uh, the question of Sarnak. Uh, what I would like to do, I would like not to perturb, but I would like to deform. So you give me a domain omega zero, and I want to consider a, a, a deformation omega t, and I want to say that the domain is spectrally rigid is when I'm making a deformation, and uh, 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 if uh, this is an isospectral deformation, then the corresponding deformation uh, 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 is an isometry which means it's either a rotation or it is a translation. And uh, um, I'll say a few words about, uh, uh, about uh, relation with the Birgov conjecture, 
but uh, uh, the, uh, the method is quite similar, even though there is uh, quite a number of different technical details. So we managed to understand the perturbative picture. So we managed to start with a circle, and there is some, uh, I think it's fairly deep analytical reason why we need to consider uh, axisymmetric domains, but uh, in the space of axisymmetric domains, you start with a circle and you shake the circle, and we manage to trace uh, the picture in this infinite dimensional space, and the result is that if your drum has an axis of symmetry and you didn't do too much harm to deform it from the circle, so basically you need to take a drum and deform it to the circle, then it is rigid. You cannot deform it without deforming the, uh, the Laplace spectrum. Uh, 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 and actually, uh, I was hoping that we'll have uh, enough of writing done, but at the moment I'll just say that we have a, an extremely plausible plan with uh, Jacopo de Simo and uh, Alessio Figali where we could study generic uh, axisymmetric domains but uh, we probably need to do, well, we need to write uh, more, more carefully uh, a few steps in the proof. But uh, I, 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 I certainly convinced that the strategy should work. So to summarize the second part of the, pro the talk is that uh, uh, somehow I'm saying that uh, studying billiards is closely related to uh, uh, the problem, can you hear the shape of a drum? And now let me draw the exact connection. So it turns out that if you give me the Laplace spectrum, then there is a formula which recovers the length spectrum. So let me first define the length spectrum and tell you uh, the relation. So now you will see connection between cuts, Sarnak, and billiards. So I start with a convex domain, and now I'll start the following game. I start with my uh, billiard, and I start to look for periodic orbits. So what are the simplest periodic orbits for the, billi for the convex billiard? The simplest periodic orbit is just the largest diagonal. And I measure the perimeter of the largest diagonal back and forth as an orbit. I put it into my length spectrum. Then I look at the shortest diagonal, and I put it in my uh, the times two. I put it in my length spectrum. Then I look at the periodic orbits of period three. Birgov says that there are always at least two. I put it in my length spectrum. So for all periodic orbits of a billiard, uh, I put all of them into the length sp spectrum. And in order to have a closed set, I also add the length of the boundary. So it turns out that uh, the Laplace spectrum knows quite well about the length spectrum, and uh, uh, it, he knows it uh, almost with a perfect precision. And here's a uh, theorem which uh, uh, goes back to many people and have been proven in 80s. So if I know my Laplace spectrum, which is a collection of eigenvalues, there is a magic box. So what does the magic box do? I plug into the magic box a number, and if the, uh, loosely speaking, if the number which comes out is finite, then it's not in the length spectrum. More formally, uh, this sum is definitely not something always defined. For example, if you plug t equal to zero, this will certainly diverge. But it turns out that this sum diverges exactly when this is in the length spectrum. So generically, generically, uh, if I know the Laplace spectrum, then I know the length spectrum. And in particular, if I deform my domain and do not change the Laplace spectrum, I do not change the length spectrum. And as a result, the question becomes, I'm deforming my domain, and I want to see whether I could deform my domain and don't touch perimeter of any single periodic orbit. And this is a billiard. It has tremendous number of periodic orbits. And the analysis which we undergo with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Desimoy, uh, Chao Lin Wei, and Desimoy and Alessio Figali, we just find a collection of periodic orbits which we can trace. So now um, I told you two stories. So there was a story of integrable billiards, and there was a story 
of spectral rigidity. And now I would like to tell you the idea of the proof because what I want to do, I want to push dynamical information uh, which is coming from finite dimensional space. I want to push it into infinite dimensional space. And I want to demonstrate the corresponding uh, technique uh, in the case of a Birgov conjecture, even though it can be done in the case of spectral rigidity. So uh, uh, I'll start with a circle, and let me remind you the result which I want to uh, consider. So <clears throat> I, I will start with a circle, uh, and uh, my circle uh, in polar coordinates uh, will be equal to uh, equation r equal to one. So um, now what I want to do, I want to deform my, uh, uh, my, my circle and my goal will be to study uh, rational integrability. So my goal will be the following. You give me a domain omega and in this domain omega, there will be countably many caustics of rotation number one third, one quarter. Uh, uh, let me do one third, one quarter, one fifth, uh, uh, one sixth, and so on. And uh, my goal is to try to deform my domain. And as I deform my domain, I want to keep track of those caustics, which are rational caustics. So why do we focus on rational caustics? Because uh, rational caustics are very special because rational caustics, they are the most fragile place under perturbations. Namely, um, when you have a, a domain then having a rational caustics, it's like for a billiard map to have a curve of periodic orbits, and this is highly fragile. So if I have a billiard map, and the billiard map has a family of periodic orbits, this is something of co-dimension infinity. So it's a family of periodic orbit. So, uh, Basically, you see it's uh, something which is very fragile, and I, I want to keep track uh, of uh, uh, what is happening. And uh, I want to study this in the functional space, namely in the space of perturbations. So even though I don't need the theorem, but uh, in general, I believe it's quite useful to study the space of perturbations and its reflection of dynamical properties. There is a theorem of uh, Barishnikov and Jarnitsky which says that uh, uh, in the space of domains, uh, there is an infinite dimensional co-dimension infinity manifold of domains with uh, rational caustics. And uh, what we proved with Kiazan is that uh, uh, actually those domains are dense. So it's like rational points are dense on the plane and we needed to use uh, some uh, tricky form of uh, Moser-Levy KEM theorem. But this is just a step forward. So back to my strategy, I want to deform a circle and I want to keep track of caustics. And I want to say that if I deform a circle and I do, do not destroy enough many caustics, then I have uh, uh, again an ellipse. So I write my domain in polar coordinates. And now I want to consider a perturbation. So everything is happening in infinite dimensional space. So here's my perturbation. D omega epsilon is equal to R, one plus the function of phi plus epsilon square correction. So if you want, I take this neighborhood uh, of the circle and I zoom it in and this is a circle. And in this neighborhood, there is a very nice basis, which, is, uh, which are Fourier coefficients. Namely, uh, the sum of 
and k cosine k phi and k minus k sine k phi. K, which belongs to z, uh, uh, minus zero, plus n zero. <clears throat> OK, now it turns out that uh, uh, if I pick one caustic, say uh, a caustic of rotation number one over six, then there is a fairly simple relation. Namely, if I make a perturbation and I don't want to touch the caustic of rotation number one over six, this would imply that the six Fourier coefficient is equal to zero. So you see, I start with a picture I know very well, which is a circle, and then I consider a tiny perturbation, and as I consider a tiny perturbation, what I uh, see is that uh, 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 I have to kill Fourier coefficients uh, uh, plus minus six. And if you kind of mentally apply this, this lemma infinitely many times, then you will kill all coefficients except of five, and those five corresponds to motion and hyper hyperbolic translations. But let, uh, let me define an object which I believe is quite useful for this problem and the problem of can you hear the shape of a drum. Uh, I take a neighborhood and I look at the linearization. So I take a deformation of my domain and let me call it a linearized integrability operator. So linearized integrability operator, in this case, it is quite trivial. Uh, uh, namely, in this case, you give me a function and it gives you a collection of Fourier coefficients. But when I think of Fourier coefficients, I think of these functionals, which are defined up there. And the role of those functionals is that whenever I want to preserve a rational caustic, I have to kill a certain, certain direction. And uh, uh, certainly in this case, it uh, 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 it's, uh, looks quite easy that the Fourier basis is a basis of the uh, uh, L2 or CR. But uh, actually, because there is no uniformity in E, there is, a, there is a, a couple of dozen of pages in order to make it rigorous. But the picture is that I look at the my billiard table and I see reflection of my billiard table in the space of perturbations. Now, let me go to the ellipse picture because the ellipse picture is different. And the way you could think of an ellipse picture is that now we'll start to deform the circle. And as we deform the circle, we want to deform this statement. So now we, we eccentricity will deform those guys and uh, here, let me say that uh, the circle has indices zero, which uh, corresponds to eccentricity equal to zero. And now we still want to understand the picture in the neighborhood of an ellipse. And in the neighborhood of an ellipse, we want to uh, uh, look at the reflection of this. Namely, we want to preserve rational caustics. And as we preserve rational caustics, we want to see what is the reflection in the space of perturbation. And it turns out there is an analog of this picture uh, taking place, and uh, I will uh, uh, analyze analog of this picture. So uh, literally, this statement is not quite correct, but it can be massaged to be correct. So what is the statement? The statement is that uh, now what I need to do, uh, I need uh, 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 <coughs> uh, instead of looking at a cosine k phi and sine k phi uh, in order to trace uh, Q's caustic, then I need a, a special parameterization. So I replace cosine k phi with the cosine phi Q of eccentricity of phi and sine Q phi Q of eccentricity of phi. Uh, so, <coughs> uh, I want to massage the statement, but the goal stays true. Namely, if I want to keep the one over six caustic, it turns out that the dot product with this guy is equal to zero. So you deform your Fourier basis, and uh, as you deform your Fourier basis, uh, there is an uh, analog of the corresponding cosine Q phi and sine Q phi, which still, which still reads what happens with the perturbation. Namely, 
You want to keep the caustic, kill the dot product. And uh, one way to view what we've done with uh, Alfonso Sorrentino is uh, we looked uh, uh, at this collection of functions and uh, uh, an important property of this collection of functions is that this collection of functions is a basis and the picture is no longer perturbative because our eccentricity becomes 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So these uh, uh, twisted signs and cosines, they start to wander uh, and uh, we had to find some other underground mechanism to show that uh, 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 they still form a basis. But the idea is very similar. You linearize and you look at the linear level, what happens in the functional space. The only delicate feature is which coordinate system in infinite dimensional space to use. And uh, uh, what I want to do, I want to uh, tell you a little bit how we managed to prove that this collection of functions form a basis because there is some uh, uh, ancient uh, but nice mathematics is involved. So it turns out that when you study ellipses, uh, the most natural uh, coordinate system, which is quite natural, uh, is uh, uh, so-called elliptic coordinates, elliptic polar coordinates. So basically what you could do for any point which is outside uh, of uh, uh, two foci, uh, uh, what you could do, you could uh, write uh, the, the following coordinate system. Uh, in this form, I'm not sure how feasible it is, but uh, if you think of an analog of an angle, then look at the, uh, or it should be hyperbolas, uh, uh, and then if you look at the analog of the radial direction, then there are ellipses. So if you look at the intersection of hyperbola and an ellipse, it gives you a coordinate system. And it turns out that this elliptic uh, polar coordinates, they know about billiard dynamics much better than the polar coordinates, which is quite natural. And now there will be a, a sequence of formulas. And when we were looking at those formulas, there was uh, a little bit of a uh, uh, scare until we understood what to look for. So, uh, it turns out is that it is important to consider complexification of the angle phi. And if you look at the complexified picture, then all of a sudden you see that these guys, they have different nature. So what is the complexified picture? I'm not sure anyone will be able to follow uh, this sequence of implicit functions, but there is a sequence of implicit functions which at the end gives you uh, what we are looking for. Namely, we introduce this uh, uh, so-called action angle coordinates uh, in the ellipse. So in order to parameterize the corresponding caustic, I need to use a parameter lambda. Uh, so as lambda goes to zero, I go to the boundary. As lambda goes to, I believe, B, uh, you go to a segment. Um, so this parameterize all your caustics and uh, there is uh, some kind of formula which allows you to find uh, a rotation number. Uh, and all those formulas are produced by elliptic integrals uh, um, uh, of the first kind. And finally, after a long string of computations, you get something. And these cosine signs and these are the same thing. And why is it I'm so happy? I mean, at first glance, the formula look, looks quite complicated. However, if we complexify phi, then you see that the poles of these guys are in a very well designed places. As a result, if pole of this, uh, say, C2 is at I, then it cannot be linearly dependent with a function which has a pole at 2I. And then you go and check analytic formulas. So the basic underground reason why these functions cannot be possibly, finite combinations cannot be possibly linearly dependent because the, the singularities are at different places. So when you look at the reals, you have no idea. But when you look at the complex, then you see that finite linear combinations are not possible. Then you go back to your machinery, you look at the tails, the tails become almost orthogonal and there is some work to complete this idea. 
So the underground reason for, uh, let me call it elliptic uh, uh, basis, uh, uh, so this elliptic basis in the, uh, in the space of uh, functions is a basis because uh, uh, the corresponding functions, they have singularities at different places. And at least at the heuristic level, uh, it uh, uh, gives you a flavor of what is happening uh, in, uh, um, uh, with the local picture. What you need to do, you need to compute the corresponding uh, linearized operator, and if you manage to invert it, uh, uh, or prove that certain property is a basis, then you <coughs> uh, feel quite happy. Okay, so this is a local picture, and, uh, but uh, the Birgov conjecture is a global conjecture. So let me uh, show you a cartoon, which uh, maybe this cartoon at some point, uh, uh, um, uh, um, okay, so maybe I'll uh, uh, um, to give you a summary and then I'll tell you how one could possibly try to prove a global uh, Birgov conjecture. So the summary, as I told you, two, two problems. So the first problem was about integrable billiards. And the problem is that uh, suppose you have a billiard whose neighborhood of the boundary is foliated by caustics. Then if the billiard has neighborhood of the boundary foliated by caustics, then it has to be an ellipse. And uh, uh, several results were basically showing that if you start close to the domain which you, whose billiard you know quite well, then you can analyze the perturbative picture. But this is the first type, it's, and it's about integrable billiards. And the second type is, uh, I told you that there is this question of cuts, can you hear the shape of a drum, which through the wave trace can be transformed into the question about length spectrum of the billiards. And uh, again, in the perturbative situation, when you consider perturbations of the circle, we managed to analyze it uh, and prove rigidity, which basically says that uh, if your uh, drum is close to the circular drum and has an axis of symmetry, then you can hear it. And uh, now let me tell you about uh, one possible approach to prove global Birgov conjecture, and we made one, one tiny, tiny little step. So it turns out that there is a PDE in the space of domains, and this PDE takes and sends every convex domain to an ellipse. And I would like to tell you, share you with the, the, what is this PDE. So there is a, a famous theorem uh, about uh, 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 curve length shortening. Namely, if you look at the curve on the plane, uh, embedded curve on the plane, and uh, if you start flowing this domain in the direction that you want to keep the area, but you want to uh, uh, make the perimeter of the boundary smaller, if you want to do curve shortening, then this uh, flow will converge everything to the circle. Um, and, uh, uh, and I want to have an affine analog of this property because I don't want everything to go to the circle. I want everything to go to an ellipse. And in particular, if I start with something which has a sufficiently large eccentricity, then I, I doubt that I will get into an ellipse. And indeed, there is a flow like this, the one which takes any convex domain and moves it to an ellipse, and it's called affine lens shortening flow. So let me explain the meaning of the word affine. So it turns out that there is an analog of curvature, which is SL2 R invariant. Namely, if you start with some domain, and if you will do SL2 R transformation, then it turns out that a fine curvature simply does not care. As a result, if you start with an ellipse and you do SL2R transformation, which makes uh, a circle out of an ellipse, any reasonable uh, definition of a curvature should give a constant curvature for an ellipse. So basically, here's the definition. I'm not sure you could uh, absorb it, but basically there is a definition of a fine curvature which involves three derivatives 
and which tells you that if uh, uh, you precise this, uh, this function to the boundary, then conics are the only curves with a fine uh, constant affine curvature, or if they are bounded, then they have to be ellipses. And uh, let me assign to my curve not lens, but affine lens. So what I do, I, uh, sorry, I didn't write it. Affine lens is you take a, a vector product of first derivative and a second derivative. Oh, that's what I did, okay. So uh, here's an affine lens. When you take a first derivative and a second derivative to the power one third, uh, and you compute it, and here's the PDE. So the PDE uh, 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 has, uh, is quite explicit, and again, it takes any domain and flows it toward uh, uh, an ellipse. And uh, there is a paper of uh, Shapiro, Tannenbaum, a very nicely written paper, which proves this result using uh, monotonicity of certain, uh, of certain ratio of affine uh, of area and a fine lens. So how do we want to apply it to Birgov? We want to apply, we want to find a monotone functional. So imagine that we found some magic functional which if your domain is integrable, it's zero, and if domain is not integrable, it's positive. If we manage to find this kind of a Lyapunov function, then we proved our conjecture because if we could prove that it's monotonically decreasing, then the conjecture of Birgov is true. And uh, as I said, it's just a, a tiny lemma uh, which we proved. So there is a, a very uh, simple functional. One could invent much more complicated functionals. So basically, you pick a point of the boundary and you look at the maximal perimeter of the inscribed Q gone and you subtract the average. So it turns out that this delta Q is zero if and only if you have a rational caustic of the rotation number one over Q. So this functional, if positive, you don't have a caustic. If zero, you have a caustic. If it's monotone, then it has to be positive because it's non-negative. So as a result, there is a really, uh, I mean, it's a, 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 we, we really don't understand much. So, but we, we managed to uh, understand this uh, little piece uh, of the orbits of a fine <coughs> uh, 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 lens shortening flow, and we managed to uh, prove monotonicity in this tiny place, uh, and maybe some PDE could uh, 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 help to prove this conjecture. And there is indeed, uh, uh, more serious hope. So it turns out that the time it takes to get to an ellipse is always finite. So if you give me a domain and I know the time it takes to an ellipse, I could choose Q which is sufficiently large and then during the whole time of evolution I will be studying orbits which are close to the boundary and when you are close to the boundary you are in a nearly integrable regime. Uh, since you are always in the nearly integrable regime, there, is a, there are perturbative formulas which you, need, you can investigate, but certainly the number of technical difficulties has to be tremendous because one has to always work with so-called Lazutkin parameterization. Okay, uh, these are some references. Uh, maybe I'll, uh, uh, so this is uh, the paper with Artur and Jakob where we studied perturbations of the circle. <coughs> uh, uh, and this is the second paper where we also studied perturbations of the circle, but for the drum. So this is for the Birgov, and this is for the drum. And uh, in, this, in this paper, which is on archive, we studied uh, perturbations of ellipses, and we, uh, we look at this idea of analytic extension of the corresponding eigenfunctions. And, um, in this paper with uh, Guan Juan and Alfonso Sorrentino, we studied local integrability, and here from local integrability, we proved uh, 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 global integrability, and this is a work with uh, Kezan about uh, 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 integrable uh, rational caustics. So let me stop here. <laughs>